I start by thanking the, or the organizers for uh, putting this workshop. Very nice, and uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, so I'd like to tell you about a machine learning perspective on the many body problem in classical and quantum physics. Um, so let me first acknowledge my, my machine learning friends, my quantum physics machine learning friends. So Roger Malco at the University of Waterloo, uh, Giacomo Torlai, um, Giuseppe Carleo, who is here from ETH, uh, Matthias Troyer, and uh, Guglielmo Mazzola. Uh, so I'm going to uh, introduce the problem very informally uh, using the complexity uh, or the complications that we see or that we experience when we try to study uh, many body uh, problems in quantum physics, okay? So, so uh, the, many body, the many body problem in quantum physics, so what the first postulate of, of uh, quantum mechanics says that uh, um, everything we can possibly know about a wave function or a quantum system comes out of uh, the wave, uh, yeah, the wave function of the system, which is this uh, vector here which uh, has typically an exponentially large amount of uh, information in the size of the system, let's say n, so it's exponential, and so it's just uh, intrinsically a uh, big data problem if you want, uh, and it's such that uh, even with uh, today's best uh, supercomputers, you can solve the wave equation or the Schrodinger equation for uh, psi uh, exactly for uh, up to, let's say, 45 particles, which is pretty small. Uh, and that's using like big, big supercomputers. So big problem and it's so bad that uh, storing the state of a 273 uh, spin system uh, requires a computer with more bits than there are atoms in the universe. So that's what we like to say. Like for, I, I think any condensed matter would uh, argue that and um, a condensed matter physicist and uh, yet uh, very important problems in uh, chemistry and condensed matter and uh, quantum computing are, are way larger than 273. Okay, so what do we do? There's quantum computing that we're, stri we're still trying to uh, figure out, so it may help in the future, but what can we do before um, we have quantum computers, right? So there's still hope for uh, classical algorithms because nature is sometimes compassionate, uh, even though I don't think nature cares about us. Uh, but <laughs> Many body systems can be typically characterized by an amount of information smaller than um, the maximum capacity, right? Like this exponentially amount of information. And that's what we exploit when we do, for instance, and when we study quantum, Monte uh, many quantum many body systems using quantum Monte Carlo simulations or tensor networks. We exploit the fact that we, um, <laughs> that we um, can characterize correlation functions and uh, observables using uh, a smaller amount of information, okay? So in QMC, what we do is we sample the state space uh, stochastically, and we're still able to get pretty accurate uh, correlation functions and so on, uh, even though the system in principle is described by an exponentially uh, huge amount of information. Uh, and the same is true uh, for uh, tensor network methods. We um, we use them, we exploit that they are low entangled, like the typically some states in nature are low entangled. And uh, so here is uh, like a diagram like of uh, Hilbert space. And here is uh, QMC, which solves some problems. There's uh, tensor networks, which solves uh, some other states in nature. Some of them we can solve uh, and then generic random states. So we, uh, so we use techniques and uh, in spite of uh, this uh, curse of dimensionality. And the same is true for the machine learning community, okay? Machine learning uh, community will deals with uh, equally high dimensional problems, even bigger than those that we care about, right? Like I heard last week uh, some uh, guns using like really high resolution images, uh, like it's incredible, like, and they battle this curse of dimensionality successfully, right? Like, and, uh, with impressive results in a wide spectrum of scientific and technologically relevant uh, ar areas of research. Um, um, and they use neural networks typically. And uh, uh, so quantum physics is uh, not the exception and there are a big bunch of uh, uh, new uh, work coming out like with uh, classification of phases, uh, 
inspired uh, machine learning inspired answers for quantum many body systems uh, quantum state preparation uh, accelerating monte carlo simulations or uh, renormalization group quantum state uh, tomography and and more and they keep coming every week so that's exciting for quantum physics and um, so the list is obviously incomplete but uh, me go on. So in this talk, I will uh, discuss several applications of uh, machine, machine learning ideas to uh, problems in many body physics. Um, in particular, I'm going to tell you about supervised learning uh, approach to a classical, um, a classical uh, phase transitions. I wrote quantum, but uh, I don't have any quantum uh, for this talk. Um, I'm going to interpret the wave function as a generative model of the reality that we see. and. Um, Using that idea, I'm, I, I'm going to write down the ground state of the Kitaev storic code um, using uh, convolutional neural networks. And then using those ideas, I'm going to focus on a slightly less uh, toy uh, problem. And I'm going to show a data intensive problem in quantum mechanics, which is that of uh, quantum state tomography um, using uh, neural networks, in particular RBMs. Uh, okay, so that's kind of like what I want to do or what I want to tell you. So the first idea is supervised learning um, perspective of phases of matter, right? So it's very simple. It's a toy uh, exercise, but uh, still fun. So I'm going to use the icing model, which I, I think most of you know, like either you come from machine learning or from physics. I think most people have seen it, but let me introduce it. So is this model is characterized by this energy function uh, E. Uh, uh, and these variables sigma i, sigma j are just uh, plus or minus one. And those uh, variables are located at uh, the uh, on a square grid. Uh, there are those uh, variables uh, here. Um, what we know about it is that uh, at low temperature, the system magnetizes either up or uh, down, just to minimize the energy uh, uh, E. Um, as you uh, warm the system up, it starts like um, getting a lot of like thermal fluctuations and then there's a phase transition in between the low temperature phase where you have uh, magnetization and the high temperature phase where the spins basically are completely random okay so that's the um, uh, icing model or the very rough description of uh, of it and what we know about it is that uh, there's a phase transition between the low temperature and the high temperature regime and the phase transition is characterized by uh, on an order parameter uh, called magnetization, which is basically the average the, or the expectation value of the uh, average over the spins in the lattice. And we know that at low temperature, the magnetization is uh, uh, finite, and at high temperature, it goes to zero. Uh, at the critical point that was predicted by Lars Onsager in the 40s. So it's a pretty well understood problem, but for the sake of uh, understanding machine learning techniques, that's what we started with, OK? So, uh, so what do I mean by uh, machine learning phases of matter? Uh, the, the inspiration came from, uh, from this MNIST uh, classification problem. So the way I understood uh, MNIST is that, for instance, a five, like the one here, can be understood as a perfect five that the computer can understand, plus some fluctuations due to the way humans write, okay? So uh, that's how you get, the, like, how I imagine, like, getting a, like a five, like a, written five um, and then the machine learning community I guess most of you have done this like this uh, like they developed uh, supervised uh, learning algorithms that uh, allow you to give in an image uh, five you get uh, outcome from the neural net a perfect five a, a five that the computer can understand and so that's what I thought right like so in in physics we understand typically phases uh, starting from a mean field perspective so for a ferromagnet is basically all spins up or down and then plus some fluctuations which are this uh, fluctuations induced by the, mm, a thermal bath okay and so the idea that I had is okay I need to understand how neural networks work so I'm going to use this si system that I understand and so what I said okay I'm going to get a big bunch of um, measurements in the ferromagnetic phase and a, another big bunch of uh, measurements in the high temperature phase and I'm going to use uh, classification right like uh, supervised learning so I was like okay let's let me try to understand how this works uh, and then what I did was I, I just sampled uh, using uh, like the, this distribution P, uh, the 
which is basically the Boltzmann weight of the icing model and a low temperature and a high temperature. And I got a big bunch of uh, samples uh, out of it. Uh, 20K samples below TC and 20K above TC. And, uh, and then I prepared this um, like a low dimensional visualization of the data where you can see already uh, everything, right? Like you see that uh, at low temperature, which is this blue um, blobs, uh, there, this uh, is where like the magnetization is pretty high, right? So, uh, and you can already see, okay, one of them is uh, spins up, uh, and the other one is uh, spins down. And then, as you warm it up, you see the color like red for warm. Then you get only one blob where like you get only uh, the high temperature phase, and in between there's this um, of, uh, quant this transition, right? Like, so I did that. Like I did. Okay, I'm going to. Um, do uh, supervised learning and I have only two uh, outcomes right like because I only have two phases and so uh, that's this plot here as a fun so uh, the blue um, curve is what I call the um, uh, low temperature neuron and the red one is the high temperature one and the blue uh, activates at low temperature and the red which is the hot uh, neuron it activates um, at uh, at high temperature, and then the curious thing that we saw is that um, there's a crossing point in between uh, around TC, right? Like as a, what we observe is oh, yeah. So at TC, basically the neural net doesn't know oh is this coming from a high temperature or low temperature? On average, it doesn't know, right? Like that's where we said okay, so that should be uh, the critical temperature, and sure enough, it coincides with the critical temperature of the model. Okay, and even uh, more, like in figure uh, B, you can get a, a collapse. So this is um, an idea from the randomization group. Uh, you, 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 you're able even to get critical exponents out of this type of calculation. So we were able to get uh, nu, which is the correlation length uh, critical exponent pretty accurately out of the uh, calculation. Um, so that's for A and B. And uh, this is perhaps the most interesting uh, result is Initially, we trained the model on the, um, on the square lattice, like the um, icing model on the square lattice, and then we took the triangular one, and then we get all those samples out of the tri triangular uh, model. And then I used the trained neural network and to process the, these images that I got out of the triangular lattice, and then I was able to compute the TC of the triangular lattice out of the trained model that um, I got from the square. So that was pretty cool, but uh, a little bit um, surprising. We said, why? Why is that? And the conclusion is that um, basically it's written here. So this, uh, we wrote down an analytical model, and we understood what the neural network learns. It learns the order parameter, OK? And um, it basically, yeah, relies on the, on the magnetization of the system to, uh, to, on the like to perform this classification, and then we uh, investigated like um, the arguments of, of the uh, hidden layer w times x plus b and we plotted that as a function of the magnetization of the configuration and so uh, in figure a so that's my uh, analytical understanding so that uh, if you want I, the, the model I trained like with my brain and then uh, in b is the untrained model and in c is when you do it numerically, then what you see is that the neurons, real, uh, what you get is functions of the magnetization. So it means that um, the neural network uses the, uh, the magnetization, or it relies on the magnetization to perform this uh, uh, discrimination problem. Same as uh, Onsager did when he, or even before that. Like, uh, um, uh, so that's the conclusion. And if you modify this and you change it to the uh, antiferromagnetic icing uh, model, then you, what you get is the stagger magnetization. And in general, what we checked is that um, um, it relies on like any uh, local order parameter that uh, you can define. Uh, so that was uh, a kind of like an interesting conclusion. And the other th experiment that we run is that uh, even if you train the model in 2D, you can get the critical temperature in 3D, for instance, because for the same model, basically they share the same order parameter, and you can still uh, make sense out of these transitions, and you get different critical exponents in 3D, and so on. So uh, that's the the conclusion of the uh, first part. Um, 
and this is for faces, like what I said, is for faces which have an order parameter, right? Like, uh, and you, you, you're, not, you're not, you may not even be surprised. One, this is very trivial. I can't even tell from seeing, like from having a look at the images that's up there here. It's basically order we know, and this one looks disordered, so why do you even need a neural network, right? So it's a very toy uh, problem, but um, then we thought, can we deal with uh, faces which do not have an order parameter? So we wanted to understand that problem, and um, so basically what I have in mind is topological faces of matter, uh, examples of which uh, fractional quantum Hall effect, quantum spin liquids, icing gauge theories, Lots of interesting uh, systems. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. No. Y we did simulations in principle, like to mimic experiments too. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So then we focused on uh, phases of matter. So there are topological ones that I just mentioned. Um, they defy uh, Landau symmetry breaking uh, classification and so on. So they're richer uh, and cool like the other example I have is Coulomb faces which are like kind of like classical or highly correlated uh, spin liquids they're described by electrodynamics and like um, one example is <coughs> common water ice and uh, spin ice materials so I'm going to focus on the um, Wegener's uh, icing gauge theory which is this uh, simple Hamiltonian uh, here H uh, is described uh, by um, uh, spins who, uh, that live on the bonds of the square lattice and the interaction is given by products over uh, the plaquettes P that I have uh, here and uh, basically the energy is just uh, this product over the four of them and it has been studied like since the, sev since the 70s uh, the, the phase diagram is known it's um, at zero temperature, we have a ground state that is classical, but is disordered, so there's no order parameter, uh, and the f uh, phase is topologically ordered, and as soon as you warm the system even a little bit, you destroy the, the phase and you go into the high temperature phase. Um, and some people call the toric code the mother of, uh, uh, of uh, topological quantum computing. I call this the grandmother because it's like half of the toric code, okay? So uh, I, I really like this system and um, basically, uh, so what we wanted to do was, can we classify uh, configurations of this system and tell the difference between t equals zero and infinity? And the nice thing is both uh, the ground state and the infinite temperature state, um, they both have um, exponentially decaying spin-spin correlations. So then, it becomes trickier for the classification uh, problem, as you will see now. So uh, here I have two configurations for the system. So one is ground state and one is uh, high temperature state. Would you like to guess uh, which is which? Uh, <laughs> like for fun. Yes, but you know a lot of machine learning, so. <laughs> 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 no, uh, that's right. Like, okay, so good. Um, I don't know how you did it, but like, <laughs> <laughs> so if you try like a feed forward neural network, um, like a fully connected the one, like the one that I used for the icing model, I just couldn't make it work. It's very difficult to train. And you always get to 50% uh, accuracy, which is as good as um, guessing, right? Like as uh, I may have tried in the past. So, um, so, so the, the, the question was what, what to do, right? Like, uh, how do we fix this? And so w the solution came, okay, I just started playing, okay, uh, with uh, different architectures and so on. And this is the one I came up with like, for the uh, first um, uh, successful uh, attempt and is using a convolutional neural network with uh, small filters. Uh, that I slide around the, uh, the configuration. And then if I train this, um, on, um, I do supervised learning the same way I did for the icing model, then I get 99% accuracy. Uh, it's easy to train, uh, and it has all sorts of nice um, uh, properties. And the picture that we draw for the, what this convolutional neural network is doing in this case is that uh, it uses the detection of uh, satisfied local constraints. And by that, I mean these um, products over the plaquettes. 
right? Like, so we call it satisfied when the product over the four spins is one because we have a minus in front. So, and that's what we figured out it, the neural network is doing. It's just checking the parity uh, of those products. Uh, and, um, and then uh, that's basically the conclusion. And then based upon that uh, idea, we, we just really literally wrote down the filters, right? Like analytically, um, for that problem, which uh, coincide with this, um, basically this expression here, uh, and and then if you use that analytically trained, uh, it's not really trained. I just write down the weights and so on with uh, 16 filters and uh, two by two patches, and I use perceptrons because I don't have to train. Um, so uh, as uh, the activation functions, then you get 100% accuracy on the on the uh, test set. Um, so that was uh, interesting, and we, we were happy. Uh, and then the, the here it comes, uh, the, uh, like a byproduct of uh, doing that. And it's the fact that um, if you take the call, the, like uh, the expression for the call neuron in this case, that uh, coincides with the, gr the ground state of a uh, quantum many body system. So that's what we figured out. Uh, if we take, uh, so if you augment this Hamiltonian, which is so this part we had, that's the Wegener's icing gauge theory, and then you augment it with this um, quantum, like uh, quantum fluctuations term, uh, term which uh, is uh, defined over the vertices of the of the square lattice, then that has been uh, analytically solved in the past. But what we figure out is that cold neuron that we used in the classification toy problem is the ground state of that Hamiltonian. So that was uh, nice and interesting and it, it made sense. And so basically, as far as I know, this was like the first time that we used, or as far as I know, the first time that uh, someone used uh, convolutional neural networks to uh, uh, write down ground states of many body systems. So it's pretty cool. You just take the square root of the neural network and then you have uh, that. So. Uh, but this uh, was extended and improved. So Don Ling then, uh, he wrote a paper where they did analytically the same and more uh, by using restricted Boltzmann machines and uh, uh, Jing Chen Song and Hai Dong Shi and Lei Wang, they did um, again solving this problem analytically with RBMs and so on. Um, um, RBMs were introduced by Giuseppe, by the way, like, uh, and, uh, like as an uh, answer for many body systems. And uh, so all this is just to tell you a message that I think is very important, uh, is that uh, neural network um, with a small number of parameters are able to write down analytically the ground state of the system, at least in this uh, very simple case. Um, they seem to be very good uh, tools for compressing quantum many-body states in analogy to uh, tensor networks. Um, but they have no limitations in the dimensionality. So tensor networks are very successful, especially in 1D. They're, they're harder to apply in 2D and in 3D. Um, most importantly, we can devise numerical procedures uh, to study systems for where like, we don't have analytical solutions like this. Uh, okay? uh, and this has all sorts of uh, potential applications in materials physics, uh, quantum chemistry, and quantum state tomography. So there's a whole lot of um, new interesting applications. Yeah. So, um, do the filters you get by training look similar to the analytical? Yes. Yeah. That's right. I try, and yes. Mm -hmm. So let me give you one example out of uh, this list. So among the potential applications, uh, I will tell you the one about quantum state tomography. Um, uh, so this is um, uh, more recent. Uh, so what's quantum state tomography? Uh, the problem is, uh, can we reconstruct the quantum state of a physical system from a limited set of uh, experimentally accessible uh, <coughs> measurements? Okay, and this is a very important question uh, because um, these measurements are available in experiments and uh, for instance in cold atoms or trapped ions and even quantum devices such as uh, D-Wave which, um, for which you can get these uh, snapshots or these um, measurements. Uh, uh, and this is important because uh, quantum state tomography is kind of like the 
diagnostic tool when you have implementation of uh, these technologies, right? Like, uh, or algorithms, or um, uh, so we think it's a pretty interesting application and is uh, a data uh, driven application. So I think um, machine learning is kind of like the right uh, or one of the right tools that we could use for this type of uh, um, uh, problems. So the problem is again, can we reconstruct the quantum state of a physical system out of a, s a set of measurements? Um, and there are some requirements uh, for quantum state tomography for large systems uh, to work. So for small systems, you can uh, use traditional methods uh, and they require exponential resources, but um, everything is very well defined and so on. So, but for large systems, you need an efficient representation of the quantum state. And in there, we uh, either have um, tensor networks like matrix product states, MPS, mm, um, Neural networks is one more, so and that's what we want to do, right? Like so, we our efficient representation. I wouldn't like to use the word efficient, but like like a simple way to represent uh, the state, or not a, not even simple, but uh, kind of like a reasonable uh, way of representing the state, as we've seen, is neural networks. And then we s need a set of projective measurements in different bases uh, um, that I represent by uh, sigma b, um, whose uh, like measurement uh, probability is given by the square of the wave function and this is basically Born's rule um, in, uh, written in, in different bases and we need then a learning procedure that makes use of this data uh, to learn the state uh, so it's again it's an inherently uh, big data problem and what we did is like we used unsupervised learning and maximum likelihood estimation um, and our neural network is uh, the RBM uh, um, uh, because uh, it's suitable for systems in basically any dimension. It has uh, compact representation uh, of the states uh, and there's all sorts of uh, available tools like for the evaluation of the quality of the results like um, log likelihood, uh, overfit, like we can check for overfitting and so on. And, um, RBMs can also encode uh, highly entangled states. So in, in this paper by Don Lingden and uh, collaborators, they, they've shown that um, they can carry a lot of uh, quantum entanglement. Um, um, uh, so that's our choice. And the most important assumption that we have is that the state is pure. So basically, uh, that's our, strong, uh, our weakest uh, point, our strongest assumption. Um, because in general, the states are mixed. Uh, uh, so, um, but, mm, but there are still some like, interesting properties. So uh, they're easy to handle numerically. I mean, RBMs, they have um, been extended uh, to a wave function by, uh, in this paper by uh, Giuseppe Carleo, who used it uh, as a variational answer for uh, quantum states. So uh, they can meaningfully represent quantum states. Um, there are all sorts of results, uh, exact representation of topological states, and they've been used for all sorts of uh, different things. So we like them in physics, even though I understand in machine learning, they're not so popular anymore. Uh, so, uh, but other choices are possible, right? Like as I've shown, I've shown CNN's work for uh, the toric code, uh, but but in this case, we use RBMs uh, extended uh, to the complex domain. Yeah. Yeah. You. Because like you can prove all sorts of things uh, with them. You can show the entanglement properties. Uh, you can uh, sample them even when they are complex. Um, so they're easy to handle, at least for, from our point of view. Yeah. Uh, and we don't typically compute the partition function. We don't require it. Uh, so we, I mean, they work pretty well, pretty well for our purposes. Yeah. Um, so what we do is, um, the goal is to find the, basically the parameters of uh, this extended complex uh, valued RBM. Um, and we do that basically by um, uh, defining a uh, KL divergence on this different basis or in these different uh, measurements that we took uh, 
or that we hope one day we would get out of the experiments. Um, and then we minimize this divergence, which, which we then average over the different uh, various uh, experimental measurements or uh, 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 synthetically generated uh, data sets. We use uh, stochastic gradient descent as well as natural gradient descent in some cases. And so here's one example. So here we took this uh, state, it's very popular in quantum optics. Uh, it's just a superposition, so it's this one here, uh, superposition of uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, 0 1, 1, and so on. And then uh, we took measurements uh, on the Z basis only for this. Uh, and then what we uh, did was let's reconstruct the wave function. Uh, and then what we did here is, in this case, we can um, compute the overlap of the reconstructed wave function with the exact one. Uh, only for this particular case and what we see is that uh, as we grow the size of the data sets we get a, an overlap like that grows with with this uh, parameter ns the number of uh, samples that we use and then it converges to one pretty quickly uh, so it means we we're, we're learning uh, the state pretty well uh, and uh, so we were happy but we wanted more or the referee wanted more <laughs> and um, uh, we so th uh, we, they like to, uh, typically in general, the wave function is not real and the one we had there was real. So we uh, introduced this complex phases, which make the it makes the problem a little bit more complicated. And then uh, we had measurements in different uh, basis sets. In this case, we have this basis, so xx, z, 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 uh, z x, x, z, 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 uh, x, uh, y exit and so on so we had all those and then we performed this uh, this technique this like extended KL divergence uh, minimization and then we got uh, the that we uh, re were able to reproduce the faces uh, pretty pretty well it, so the exact ones are here so the colors mean mean nothing it's just the the, um, the amplitudes are, are this uh, if you want this the size of the of this, um, uh, this figures. <laughs> and then the reconstructed ones are in here, like from the RBM. So we, we were able to show that it works pretty well, even in that case. Um, we took also many body systems, like uh, the one transfer field icing model in 1D for a relatively uh, significantly large uh, systems. and. Here are uh, correlation functions obtained from Quantum Monte Carlo, and here are uh, correlation functions for the r uh, restricted Boltzmann machine. So they match uh, relatively well with some noise, but uh, that's fine. And we were also able to measure, like to reconstruct the wave function for the two dimensional transfer field icing model. And, and here are reconstructions of the observables um, uh, uh, as a function of the transverse field. Um, H and even if we just use the uh, measurements on the sig uh, sigma z basis we're able to reconstruct observables which are off diagonal uh, pretty accurately right like those those here in blue are reconstructed uh, reconstructed out of the RBM so it means that we that the, the RBM has some sort of like generalization when you even when you try to uh, take measurements which are I mean, which the wave function has never seen, right? That was interesting, and the same is true in, like, for the 2D XXZ uh, Hamiltonian. And finally, the most interesting result is when you want to compute uh, entanglement, because um, for experiments, this is a very challenging quantity to, uh, to to compute or to get experimentally. But what we're proposing is that you, we can do quantum state tomography, and then. Once you have this wave function, the RBM or the complex RBM, you can uh, you can then compute entanglement. And what we've shown here is that when we uh, try to do that, we're pretty successful, right? Like, um, so uh, black is results from exact diagonalization, and the dots and squares and so on are results from um, uh, obtained from the restricted Boltzmann machine. So. Um, so for experiments, this is like a, a way uh, to uh, get this entanglement measurements. And the meaning for the RBM is right, what, what I would like to say is that uh, it shows that it really learned uh, to generalize very well because that when you're doing this type of uh, entanglement measurements, you really uh, uh, 
you really need values of the wave function or the RBM that are pretty far from the um, from the training set, typically, especially when you have pretty large systems, where like the size of the training set is really really uh, small compared to the like the size of the Hilbert space. Uh, okay, so let me finish. So we encode and discriminate phases and phase transitions, both conventional and topological, using neural network technology. And we have a uh, relatively solid understanding of what the neural nets do in those cases through very controlled analytical uh, calculations. And we have performed quantum state tomography uh, based on uh, neural networks and RBMs. Um, and we think this uh, is very promising, at least like for, uh, like for quantum state tomography. And let me uh, finish by saying that we have some uh, research uh, scientist positions and postdoctoral fellows at the Vector Institute, uh, as well as uh, PhD studentships and, and so on. So with that, I would like to thank you. What do you mean by size, by like the system size? Yes. Uh, so yeah, so we did that uh, more or less carefully. Um, also, the question is, when you change the system size, what happens, right? Like uh, that there's a dependency of the critical temperature. So what we did was, um, what we've shown is that as we grow the size of the system, the critical temperature approaches, uh, and it goes closer and closer to the theoretical result for the infinite system. That's what we've uh, checked. I just don't have a plot here. And then, uh, uh, but, but yeah, so in typically, it, as you grow the system size, uh, you approach the analytical result when, you, when there is one. Mm -hmm. I, yes, so I, th I have several ideas about that. So one of them was already um, exploited by um, our friend Miles Studenmeyer is this supervised learning using uh, tensor networks. So tensor networks are this, um, this representation of uh, a function or a wave function and they've been pretty successful in physics. And so what uh, Miles did was use those to perform supervised learning. And then this was extended to uh, unsupervised learning and so on. And I think there's room uh, for this type of uh, methodologies to expand to machine learning. It's just that I don't see many people doing it. It needs more like uh, people playing with it, as, as far as I, uh, I know. You pick. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can you expand more on, um, so you just mentioned uh, tensor networks. Can you expand more about this efficiency uh, as a representation of uh, conceptually and numerically? Because you mentioned in the talk that the efficiency was uh, higher higher dimensions, right? Because you have to um, decompose a, a matrix and get to the so, so is the problem just that, or um, can you give more space? So they're, they're pretty efficient, even like uh, theoretically efficient when you have low entanglement. It means that the entanglement entropy of the system that you want to study is finite. Uh, 
it's basically a constant for 1D systems. And in that case, then yes, you can. But for instance, if you take a system to uh, its critical point, then the uh, entanglement uh, is it grows uh, significantly, and then the representation is no longer uh, efficient. Uh, so it dip really depends on the system that you're interested in, um, and so you have to be careful, like uh, where you apply it. And like, mm -hmm. is your feeling just right now um, your need for CNN and RPMs to um, <coughs> tackle that's your point? That's one thing I would like to uh, work on, right? Like. Uh, pursue this line of ideas, like using... Mm -hmm. uh, let's thank Juan again. Thank you. Thank you.